It doesn't matter if the legacy is good or bad. You must learn to appreciate it. Why? Because there is a lot more legacy than non-legacy code in the world, and you have to be able to live with that. Even if you want to successfully replace legacy with newer code, you need to start with appreciation and respect for that code because it somehow runs, and there is no guarantee that the new code will do a better job. Now, listen to the Evo Lukács from Netgen. Now, listen to the Evo Lukács from Netgen. Think about the profound message of this lecture and visit the Web Summer Camp in Opatia in the summer. I never had that kind of intro, okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, looks like it was a long night, <laughs> at least for me. <laughs> uh, okay, so, uh, Shall we start? Uh, just a few words about me. I'm a managing partner of a company in Croatia. I'm actually 20 plus, I don't know, it's, it's more than 20 years of everything around web, from building websites, maintaining websites, um, speaking about it, um, leading a project, developing code, telling others to develop code, etc., etc. So uh, I got a lot of experience from that. I also, I, my title is also Chief One to Blame for the Web Summer Camp. There is also this Twitter slash X thing if you want to follow me. Uh, the NetGen uh, company is a company which is 21 years old now. And we do design development of digital solutions. Uh, there is 60 roughly people in Zagreb and in Zurich. And we do projects across EU. Uh, what we also do, what I mentioned, is something called Web Summer Camp, which is an event in Croatia during summer, obviously. Uh, we have the dates for next year. So uh, it's, I think it's a bit better weather than here, at least that. Uh, we, we have PHP track, Symfony track, JavaScript track, UX track, so it's not only for developers, you can bring your fellow front-end engineers and designers and business people, so you can all come there uh, July next year. So quickly, it's uh, from here, the closest uh, Mediterranean spot, it's here, so the closest spot, you need to cross two or three countries to get there. Of course, you can fly or you can drive, but be there. If you want to take a, a QR code and have it on your phone, Web Summer Camp, okay? Okay. So, why this topic? Um, I did my share of programming and developing. I'm, I'm no longer, actually, I just fixed all bugs that nobody understands uh, because of the code I written 15 years ago. Um, but what I do or on a daily basis, I, I you know, talk to developers, I work with them. And um, I always get this frustration, you know, like, oh, why do we need to work with this code? Oh, this code is uh, something that is very old, I cannot understand it. Uh, it's very tricky to change old code and stuff like that. So they get really frustrated. Uh, question for you. Are you frustrated with working on old legacy code? Who is not? Oh, very nice. Okay, there are a few. But le let's wait for, uh, for the end of the talk. <laughs> then we will repeat the same question. So, before we go into this, uh, there is a small story which I composed. It's, a, of course, imaginary story. But maybe you will find some uh, some similarities. So meet Zed. He just gradu graduated. He wants to use, you know, like you know, new stuff. For example, I don't know, blockchain or something like that. Of course, he doesn't have a lot of experience. He just kind of works something, but no experience. Obviously, he's young, so he searches for internship. He joins a new technology to work on blockchain. He doesn't want to work on old uh, technologies. It's not sexy, it's not cool. So after one month, 
Yeah, usually that happens. So the first project, yeah, it took a lot of time to onboard him. For a small feature, he worked like one month. There was no documentation or like little documentation. One of the guys who was the responsible for that just left a few months ago. Right? And there was a very uh, kind of often a what the fuck moment. He would usually shout, whose code is this? And then after a while, the company said, OK, it doesn't make any more sense. Let's do the rewrite. Let's start from scratch. Just do the full rewrite. You know. Forget the old stuff. They introduce new, new tech. So blockchain is no longer cool. Let's do the artificial intelligence, machine learning, whatever. Uh, you know, they said, you know, there is one year, there is the team, let's do it, okay. So they're working, 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 after one year there's a relaunch, everything looks really great, but there are some rough edges. And then they just do quick fixes before going live, there is no time of course to doing tests, obviously. Then of course the business, Aha, uh -huh. we need to do some couple of new features that we need to add. The, you know, the managing director wants to add a couple of things that he thinks they are cool. So they push it in, of course, no tests. Then they are finally live. The first thing that I want you to remember from this talk, no new software survives the first encounter with the user because the users are using the software in so many ways that you never think of. There are so many edge cases, so many bugs that you need to fix. And of course, users want new features. So you have the backlog growing and you're working on that. Of course, business wants to earn money from it. And then, what happens? Business as usual. After a bunch of features added to it, the technology progresses, no longer AI is the thing, there is something new, of course. And there's, of course, a lot of compromises along the way. And then, what happens, our Z is no longer willing to work on that. I can't remember the last time I wrote meaningful code. He left, leaves, he becomes a security guard. And the context is lost. Whatever he had in his head, is gone. The new project has the same problem like the old project. They are basically in the same situation like a couple of years ago. So meet Fabienne. She was hired. She got the task to add a new feature. Obviously that was Zed. So, déjà vu. And then Fabienne shouts, whose code is this? And then a colleague said, Z. Who's Z? <laughs> no, that's another story. Z's gone. <laughs> so that was a short story. I hope you got some uh, yeah, familiar things. So let's get back to the serious stuff. So what is legacy code? Uh, you know, when you go to Google it, you will find a lot of uh, different kind of explanations. But what I found, like, a, let's say, an average perception is that it's a software, but it's difficult to change. So that's like the overall perception of developers. It's hard to change it because it's old, it's bad, it's whatever. So, I would actually scratch this here. Why? Uh, it's a very important thing because this talk is, by the way, it's not about PHP. There is not, no PHP in the, in the slides or whatever. It's more general talk. So, this is a philosophical talk. I want to help you to uh, overcome of your frustrations. So, it's very important to figure that you need to forget this. And this is what actually Paul Dragunis said yesterday. He spoiled my slide. 
So that's my slide as well. We were coming here uh, together with a, on an airplane from Frankfurt, and he said to me this, and I said, oh, fuck, I have a slide like that. So uh, legacy code is any code working in production. As soon as you put it in production, it's legacy. Why? Actually, I will explain it with an apple. So the apple grows, it's shiny, it's very tempting, it's very uh, healthy when it's on the tree. As soon as you pick it, it starts to rot. Of course, you don't see it immediately that it's going to rot, but it will end up here. As soon as you pick it, so as soon as you deploy on production, it's legacy code. Why? Because it did that code in production is raising technical debt. That's why it's legacy code. So it doesn't matter if that code is five minutes old or five years old or 25 years old. Okay? Do you agree? <laughs> so what is technical debt when you talk about technical debt? Now, I could do you know, two presentations only on technical debt, which of course I will not do right now, but what I will explain to you very visually, what is technical debt? So, technical debt is basically something that grows over time, even by itself. So there is intrinsic and external reasons why technical debt happens. Intrinsic means that even that nobody does anything, it will rot. Why? because you have internal things like people changing in the, in the team. Right? That's, even if you don't touch it, there will be some context lost. And then external, all your dependency, nobody writes anymore anything which is only his code. You are here, and then you have a pyramid of dependencies. You know, think about composer, install, and then everything else been below that, the operate, even operating system or kernel and whatever. So you have so much dependencies and they change. So even if you don't do anything, the technical debt will, will grow. If you don't upgrade or things like that. And of course it, it grows because you add features, you change it. If you don't cover with test, if you don't document, if you this and that, it will grow. And of course, if you are adding features too fast, then whew, you are growing it even, even, even quicker, even faster. And why is that important? Because when, while you are you know, changing the code, etc., the code rots. Problem. Why is this also happening? Or why, why do we have this too fast change? Because the business, they want features, right? They want, oh, we want this, they don't want that. They don't understand technical depth. They don't understand development. They want features. You know, it's very hard to sell to the, to the business, oh, we will do a big upgrade. And then the business says, but what will I see? What will I get? Oh, nothing. Everything will be the same. We will just spend 500 hours. What? I mean, they don't get it. They want immediate gratification. They want to see. That's why usually the upgrades are packaged in, oh, you need a new feature? We also need to do the upgrade, of course. <laughs> so you pay the debt by maintaining the software and reducing, controlling the technical debt. So it should be like this. It starts and then, okay, we did that, a new big feature, but at this point said, oh, whoa, 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 stop. We need to clean up some things. And then it goes like this. The technical debt is never zero. It's not possible to have a zero technical debt. No way. Only when you stop to using the software, then you get technical debt zero. You just need to delete all code. Then you have technical debt zero. So uh, I would like to tell you uh, what I learned from developers, what I hear from developers when they tell me something and then I say, wait, this is not good, this is wrong. So let's start with the box of misconceptions. Developer code, oh, they develop, some developers said to me, oh, we are just here to write code, not shit Sherlock. You know, what? 
What, only write code? I mean, what about reading code, documenting, moving unused code, upgrading, refactoring, uh, writing tests, automating, mentoring other people, right? This is what developers need to do. Especially this part as well. Just read the code. Usually the code uh, is more uh, uh, read than written. If you don't do it, then you have more and more difficulties over time. If you just add, write code, write code, write code, you will have more and more technical debt. There should be enough time to control the technical debt. You need to have enough time to do all this and say to the developers to do it. Imagine this garden. What you can see from this garden is that the gardener is here every day. Now, if something happens to the gardener, he doesn't come to this garden for a year, you will not be able to pass through the garden because it was just, it will be just a jungle. So that's what you need to envision. You need to, that's why I need to maintain or take care of the code so you have a beautiful garden, not a jungle. Then there is some things like, oh, the, the technical depth, that's just code shittiness, meaning that, you know, this is because of the shitty code, right? This code doesn't match my personal preference. I don't like this code. I would like to have it differently. Uh, and then, you know, everyone is, gets upset because it's usually all code, bad code. But why do you say it like this? The legacy got, got the perception because maintaining code is not cool. And then it leads to unmaintained code. And then developers leave. And then this reinforces the bad perception. So you have this vicious cycle. Because we are not maintaining code, it gets ba more bad or more uh, bad uh, connotation to it, right? Once you build it, you are done. It's like my job is just to build it. Whatever happens afterwards, I don't care. That's a misperception. But implementing a piece of code and actually the, the life cycle of the code, it's way longer. Imagine you, what, what is the oldest code you wrote? I mean, which is still running in production. Mine is like 15 years in average. <laughs> so it's easy to just make code and then, oh, I'm done. Let someone else maintain it. And the hard part is actually maintaining the code. The cost of ownership, so the, uh, the, the cost of implementing the code and then having this code be maintained for 15 years it's, it's actually costs more. And legacy code is bad code. This is the most typical one. Like whatever is legacy, it's bad. It's not the best. The architecture is not good, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Paul was in here yesterday and gave gave the, s some examples of that. Don't blame it on your previous colleagues, on developers, because that code that you are now maintaining, it was modified and changed and adapted and glued and neglected. It survived a lot of things in the life cycle, right? It works. So if it's on production, it provides value. That's the most important thing about legacy code. It's running. Whatever you write now on your machine, it's there is no value in it until it's in production. So the code, the legacy code, which is 15 years old, is infinitely better than your code that you are written now on your laptop because it serves the purpose. Your code, your new code, doesn't serve any purpose until it's in production. When it's in production, it automatically becomes legacy code. OK? All good? Do you agree? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, just remember these one of the old things he goes. Good intentions. Good intentions. Let's see. Will this work? Yeah, good intentions. Oh. We had good intentions. 
Okay. And then, of course, there are uh, some of us say that whatever we write, it's perfect, you know. Everything new is perfect. And then, you know, it cannot be perfect. There is no perfect code. It still needs to be, even if it's a perfect code, it still needs to be maintained. The only measurement of, you know, quality code is the amount of what the fucks per minute. That's the only valid version. So imagine you are writing a code now. After five years, there is a Fabienne or whatever coming. Will she have what the fucks per minute? How many? Right? So you can, when you write code, you also always need to think about Fabienne in five years so that she doesn't have what the fuck moments. Fixing old code is annoying. I know. I know. It's annoying. I would like, you know, I would like to write my code. Why do I need to change this old code? And then you go to git blame. Oh, it's my code. Uh, don't judge. Uh, yeah, make it more like a fun thing. You know, become an Indiana Jones of code. You know, practice code archaeology. This my colleague in front row. He likes to think of himself as code archaeologists. Uh, there are a lot of things that you can kind of uh, practice. One of the things he will mention it a bit more. Boy, Boy Scout rule. If you open a, any kind of code a file with code, you need to leave it better than you open it. Okay? Okay, I like that one as well. So it's always like, let's just do the full rewrite. Uh, usually, it's like, most of the time, it doesn't make sense to do the rewrite. And I will explain you why. Of course, why? Sometimes you need to do it because the old code got stuck completely. You cannot upgrade it. Uh, there is no one who understands it. Most of the people were gone. So sometimes you need to do a full rewrite. But if you have the same culture, so the same people doing the rewrite, they will produce again in a couple of years the same thing. So what I co call this garbage in, garbage out. Okay, so let's tr think about the positive things right now. So working code deserves attention, which means you need to document in one way or the other, in the code, outside of the code, or here or there, on video manuals or uh, documentation, doesn't matter. Try to, of course, cover it with automated tests. Now, that's an, I know that's a lot of work, but try to make it. We also had uh, some uh, presentation yesterday talking a lot about how to approach automated tests, etc. You need to upgrade it constantly, as, as, as often as you can. Uh, you know, refactor things, remove un uh, the dead code. There's always some dead code, by the way. Uh, you make it to ha uh, you, we make it so that you can easily change it. It's not easy to make easy changeable code. Yeah. This is what happens usually. Uh, you know, you need to teach the developers to uh, the to kind of always be in the code, reading the code, uh, improving it. Uh, you know, reward whoever maintains the code. Try to reward him. You also talked yesterday about, or Paul talk, mentioned strangler pattern, and uh, my colleague will also uh, later today talk about the other practices. You know, there's so many tools to use. You know, if you have some old code, then start bringing things like you know all these tools that uh, you know we have so try to analyze the code try to kind of get a grasp on it use the tools and also one most important probably thing is how to how to approach the dead code is why you know why are some things implemented uh, you know naming that that's super super hard you know N the, the the naming of uh, uh, 
of stuff is the one of the most hardest thing in development anyway. So in the old code, one of the biggest problems of old code is that the, the naming convention, the, the name of the functions and variables and classes is somehow maybe even wrong from the beginning. But after 10 years, it got even more wrong. Uh, you need to talk with the business, like uh, yesterday Paul mentioned, they sat down with the, with the business and then tried to go into the better understanding, better communication of what the code needs to do, supposed to the code, what is code actually doing. And that's also one more thing from the practice. If you are documenting or let's say commenting whatever in the code, you have a function and you want to uh, you want to put some doc uh, some uh, comment right of the function, and then you have the function name, function create invoice, and then in the comment you say this function creates invoice. There is no value in that. So what you need to do is document why, not how, but why this function actually is implemented. And then of course, what if? And that's the most popular one. Yeah. You have a, the most important tech lead. What if the bus hits him tomorrow? I know it's a bit kind of uh, not, a pop not a very popular thing to think about, but that's important. You know, what if Z leaves? What happens? What happens if we remove some part of the code? What if we use a library instead? Maybe the library is better, maybe not. Trying to remove dependencies, not just add dependency. That's also sometimes interesting. And then, oh, I needed to put at least one ChatGPT mention. Sorry, that's the bu uh, the buzzword. So maybe we can write the documentation based or using ChatGPT. That would really be helpful. And now a lot of people ask me, okay, this is all nice. You are talking to developers, right? So oh, we know this, but the problem is the business. You know, business is not giving us resources, they don't understand, etc. So I know it's hard, it's hard to explain to, to business that this needs to be done. But the only, or the, the best way to actually explain it is, you know, communicate about risks. Risks are, okay, if we don't do it, this will happen. You know, scare them a bit. That's probably the only way. This also, I think, uh, also Paul mentioned yesterday, is you know, tell them if we don't do it, then whatever happens, it will be hard to change. Communicate the risks. Don't judge. Don't judge, uh, because you will be in the same position. You know, you will be judged eventually, right? Because after five years, people will say, "Oh, this guy wrote. You know, who is this code? Oh." That was that old bloke. He left to become a security guard. Don't be frustrated. Don't be like Zed. Be like Paul. <laughs> Where is Paul? He's still sleeping. Uh, uh, I left him at 3 a.m. by the way. He was, he st he was still up. Uh, one of the last things that I want you to remember and understand. So, you are not a complete engineer and programmer if you don't regularly maintain and change old code. Right? Because there you have the experience. You see all the bad architecture, the bad code, the bad examples. Uh, we, we have a Slack channel uh, in our company, coding where we share, you know, things. And then there is another coding dash what the fuck, where we share bad code. So learn from the bad stuff, how not to do some things. While you are maintaining the code, you have a much bigger impact on your business than writing new code. I know it's kind of counterintuitive, but trust me, because if you have something which is running for 10 years, and if you maintain it, it provides value for the business, it has a lot of value in that. And if you do some side for a gig, 
uh, something new which will maybe not even get into production, there is no value to it. So, uh, there is a lot of value in maintaining the code. Um, yeah, try to find a, a joy in this. You know, try to make a kind of fun thing. Oh, there is a bug in production. Okay, let's try to fix it. And then after two days, yeah, we found a bug. We just changed one letter uh, and it fixed it. Actually, it happened to me. I, I was working once for one day and I changed only one character and I fixed the bug. It took me one day. That's, that was the legacy code. Working code. So, I will invite you at 6 p.m. It's the last talk of the day. My, my is the first one, the last talk of the day. My colleague will actually talk about practical things, what I'm talking. I didn't give you much of practical advices in the code. I was talking more philosophically, but I am definitely advise you to go to this lecture because we will go through way more uh, code examples. Uh, in PHP, of course. Uh, so today at sex, uh, sex six. <laughs> uh, today at sex. Wow, that sounds good. Uh, and the co the lecture is called Back to the Future, because you know you are bringing the old code back to the future. Great stuff. Uh, yeah. Any questions? I have this thing, so I need to throw it at someone. Come on. Questions? Oh, wow, you are far. Oh, come on. Just throw it back to him. This guy doesn't watch, he will get in the head. <laughs> Give it back. <laughs> Don't you think that uh, having a Slack channel coding what the fucks leads to judging people? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we often put our own code there, so it doesn't have to be judged because you often find our own code for, from years before and we put that there. Yeah. So it's also educational, so it's not always just judging. <laughs> No, we, uh, we are kind of making it uh, fun, so we try not to judge, but let just say, okay, this, this is what I found, this is what you shouldn't do. Right? So it's, it could be judgmental, but we try not to be, but it will be more educational. But a good catch. Anyone else? Come on. I like to throw things, you know, especially when I'm frustrated. Come on, questions. I like questions. We have more. We have ten more minutes, right? Please elaborate the when to do it through rewrites. How? When? when? How? How can we tell that the full rewrite is necessary? Well, usually when uh, you get to the point where nobody can uh, change the code in for a current system, there is like. You need to do it, and there is no ha how to do it. There is no people, there is no knowledge, there is no documentation, nothing to change the code. That's a good sign, okay, th this looks like we need a rewrite because we cannot change it anymore. And this can happen. So no one else knows the programming language the project yeah, has written? Something like that. You know, pe people leave, people leave, uh, nobody knows how to deploy. That, that could be a good sign as well. Like, you know, people leave and then they, there's no documentation. Or maybe there is documentation, but nobody knows where is the documentation. That's also possible. So, so it's, you know, there is no way to how to change something. And then, of course, it could be better if to find someone who could figure it out. And then that's the technical depth because it takes too much time to do a small change. You know, you need to do a small change, it takes like two days. And then it's better, well, Paul was mentioning yesterday, they had the Symphony 1, and then the way how they changed it uh, was better than uh, doing a full rewrite. So they were kind of using the strangler pattern to slowly replace the old code. Like, sometimes you cannot do it. You know, sometimes it's just there is no, no one to fix that. Right? And then you need, it, 
there is no other option but you need to try not to get into that situation that's the point you know when you are there it basically means that nobody touched or maintained the code for several years right? because dependency changed people leave uh, you know there is an old PHP version in production that uh, you cannot upgrade because of the operating system, whatever. So there is always some kind of combination where it leads that there is no way how to move forward. And then you need to do a full rewrite. But what I also said in uh, the in the intro, what intro said is that there is no guarantee that whatever you write from scratch, new, that it will be actually better from the old code. I mean, new technology doesn't do that. New technology is just new technology. It doesn't guarantee that it will be better code. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Anyone else? What is the best way to document the technical debt? I mean, uh, uh, it's, it happens that we cannot do this instantly. In this, we need to put it on, on, on the backlog and later, but what is the best way to, to, to document, to document it, it and do it, for example, later, next, next sprint or something? The best way is always to do it at the same time. So... In perfect word. In perfect word. So you need to write code that is easy to read. So, so it's so easy that it's dumb. And then you need to document the whys. And then when you, as you are writing code and document the whys, you can then generate the documentation later from the code. If, if you have all the whys in the code, that, that documentation will be very useful. But that's ideal. You know, in, the, in the real world, developers don't like to write documentation and comments, right? Who likes to write documentation and comments? Only one person. You are weird. <laughs> <laughs> so, or use uh, some AI things, you know. ChatGPT, please document this code. <laughs> Maybe it will work. I, I mean, uh, yeah. there is some situation where we cannot do that right now. We cannot uh, fix this uh, or uh, pay this technical debt uh, yeah. right now. We need to do it in the future. Yeah. And what is the best way to not forget about it? Well, you definitely need to write an issue somewhere in the issue ticketing system, put it in the backlog, and then groom the backlog, which means go uh, sometimes go back to it, see what can you take. I mean, some of the companies uh, or the businesses, they, they actually provide like 20% of the time of developers to do these kind of things. You know, you have a like you have a window to do these kind of things. They kind of provide, but that's some companies. In some companies, there is never time for that. So you need to find the time, find the time while doing one thing. You also do maintenance. That's the you know that's the only way. You need to do it. The only thing is, will business understand it or not? If they understand it, they will provide uh, time windows, time slots, and resources for that. If they don't, then you steal the time. You take the time from the issues that you do for new features, and then do some of the maintenance in, in that. Because you need to do, do it. Otherwise, you will get stuck like that at some point. Right? This is an undercover job. Undercover, yes. Indiana Jones. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when business don't know what is or how to deal with technical debt, uh, it's our uh, responsibility to tell them what is it and what, which is the best way to tell them that technical yeah. debt is something important and we have to deal with them. Yeah. This is what I mentioned in the slide. So it's easy to say it's about business they don't understand. Of course they don't understand because you didn't explain it to them. So first you need to say, we need to take care of that. We try as much as possible to explain it to the business. And the best explanation are the risks. So you can scare them and say, if we don't do this, 
that will happen. And then you will have a problem, a big problem. So if this guy leaves, he knows too much. What if he you know, leaves? We'll have a lot of problems. So he needs to then mentor someone, uh, document the things, uh, try to distribute the stuff, learn others how to do it, etc., etc. Et so, and that takes time. So you, you need to provide enough time. Maintenance is not just going into code. Maintenance, uh, there's a lot of things about maintaining code. It's not just one thing, it's a lot of things, which I wrote on the slides. It's going through the code, documenting code, testing code, automated tests, upgrades, uh, deployment procedure, automating deployment procedures, uh, other procedures, mentoring other people. So that's all maintaining. It could uh, seem like it's hard to tell that, but it's for me like uh, growing with the children. The business is our children. We <laughs> have to tell them how they should um, deal with us and our problems. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it starts from you. So I will try to make this uh, version of presentation for business people, right? So I will try to explain it to them. But uh, you, the first one is, are you. So first go from you and then go to them. You cannot just say, oh, business under doesn't understand it. Uh, they will not give us time. Uh, everything is you know, bad. We don't have time for maintenance. That's just easy surrender. You need to fight for it. Anyone else? Oh, there's more. We have three more minutes. Ooh. <laughs> okay, uh, small question. Uh, do you have like a golden rule? How much time your team will spend on bringing new features uh, versus maintaining the old code? Ooh, that's a very that's yeah. that's hard to measure. That's hard. To, Ivan, Ivan, do you have a number? No. But it is more like 50, 50, 50 or ninety versus ten percent. Uh, actually, I I did ask I did ask this several times. And it's either someone says 50-50, but someone, some people say it's 80 to 20. Mm -hmm. 80 being maintaining. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that would be definitely very difficult to uh, explain to business. <laughs> yeah, I mean, business doesn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> they okay. think they are doing the new features, right? <laughs> but they're actually spending time on fixing okay. old stuff. Thank <laughs> you. Okay. Anyone else? There was one, yeah. Uh, just throw it there. Huh? Excellent. Oba, good. Uh, any hints for, to support, motivate long living maintenance? In example, we are agreeing to change our, to introduce architecture into our monolith. It won't happen within one work, and we agree that we will, we will improve that whenever we are working on the code. Yeah. So it will take time. Yeah. Of course it will take time. Yeah, yeah. so any, any ideas how to keep it on track? Uh, you were at yesterday at Paul's uh, talk, no? So, and then come to the talk of my colleague at six. He will talk more about these patterns, how to do it, you know, how to, how to approach this gradually, not like Big Bang but start slow and, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got this sign, so uh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>